Good afternoon. Good afternoon, my name is Jim Conlon and welcome to the latest episode of our entertainment show. As you know, each week we look at the current features in terms of looking at TV series that have left a cult classic uh, uh, in terms of their memories, in terms of the entertainment industry. And one of our special features this uh, coming month is we're looking at the many people who have guest roles in the iconic uh, TV series Friends. As you know, Friends is one of the most iconic comedy series. It featured uh, Jennifer Aniston, it featured uh, Matt LeBlanc, Courtney Cox, Lisa Kudrow, David uh, Sh Schwimmer, and um, uh, many more uh, characters uh, along the way, if, uh, dare I say, if I'm forgetting one or two. But uh, we're just... But we just want to uh, just talk about uh, special uh, pe people who have played uh, memories of their time and friends who have made a guest appearance and role. And our special guest this evening is the one and only Mitchell, Whit Mitchell Whitfield. If you think that name rings uh, a bell to you, uh, the name Barry and the name Rachel Green and uh, the whole synopsis of that, uh, Mitchell played the role of Bar Barry Faber. Uh, who was uh, the guy who uh, Jennifer Aniston, uh, Rachel Green stood up on the aisle uh, in terms of leaving him. And uh, but lo and behold, they got back together and broke off. And then Barry sort of got with uh, Gen uh, Rachel's sister and uh, a whole sort of family affair. Uh, first of all, delighted to have you, sort of Mitchell. And Mitchell, friends, is it still very much fresh in the memory or does it still seem such a long time ago now? You know what? I think it's actually, thank you for having me, by the way. And by the way, when you say my name, it so much, sounds so much better than when I say my own name. I could listen to you say my name 24 hours a day. So thanks for That's making good. me sound so good. Um, you know what, Jim? I think it's actually a mix of both because there are part, there's, there's sometimes when I sit around and say, you know what? Oh, that seems like such a long time ago. And then I'll see an episode on television or I'll hear people talking about the show. And the fact, and you kind of mentioned this in the introduction, the fact that we're talking about a TV show more than 25 years later, that isn't still relevant and not just iconic. This is something that people still talk about every day. It's like you know, whenever they release or re-release the episodes, whether it's on HBO or Netflix or whatever streaming platform has the rights to it, it's like a whole new group, a whole new generation gets to enjoy the show all over again. And there's this resurgence of attention that goes toward the show. And I think because of that, it never can feel too far away in my mind, even though sometimes it does, because there's always this new audience that is consuming the show. So it's kind of fun for me to sort of sit back as an actor you know, you never think when you do something, oh, this is going to be something that lasts for decades. I'm going to be relevant for decades to come. And then sure enough, you have these projects that are still around that give you visibility that people still talk about. It's kind of mind blowing, basically. And I suppose, uh, Mitchell, just in terms of that, obviously with Friends, what made it so appealing was the actors were playing characters their own age. I mean, they were all around the 28, 29 mark at that stage and they were playing characters of that age. And obviously you got to play a character of a similar sort of age, a sort of similar role as well. That sort of uh, mass appeal that people were saying, well, these are five friends in a big, massive sort of city and we get to see all their affairs of their lives and they went to school together in certain elements and then they're brought back together and different characters or different people that have been in their lives start to interwove and come together. And that's your role of Barry, sort of, you were there at the beginning in terms of this uh, guy who was this obstacle between... Ross and Rachel and that's a kind way of putting it so yes thank you for saying obstacle that was very kind no problem but uh you were sort of this uh let's I say this sort of third wheel in terms of this big sort of love interest and then you start to come around in in terms of you start to as your character comes around we get to see a different side of Barry as we get to see you in more episodes yeah, and you know what the sad part is? I think at the beginning, and by the way, to this day, people will stop me on the street. There are always two things that mostly, I mean, I've done a lot of different films and TV series over the years, but the ones that, you know, still are relevant today that people talk about, it's either Friends or My Cousin Vinny. Because I was in My Cousin Vinny also, people still talk about that movie all the time. So when they recognize me, it's usually one of those two things. And with My Cousin Vinny, they'll say, hey, one of the two Utes, that's great. But with Friends, I get, oh, you're that jerk from Friends. That's become, but you know, that's my battle cry. Yes, I am the jerk from Friends. Try wearing that for a few decades, right? Um, and I think like when, like you said, and you put it very well, when I first came on the show, I was this obstacle. You know, I was something that was getting in the way of that, you know, that David Schwimmer, 
you know, Jennifer Aniston romance. And then I sort of go away and then I come back and we see a little bit of a softer side. And then you sort of have, you know, empathy for this character. All of a sudden, Barry isn't such a bad guy. And then he shows a true colors again and people hate him. Then he comes back and there's a little bit of sympathy. So this poor character, Barry, could not get out of his own way. Anytime there was any minute amount of sympathy that was being thrown his way, the writers made sure to do something that would put him right back in the doghouse. So for me, it was kind of fun because I think over the years, I played a lot of regular guy characters, usually a nice guy character, which was nice because I feel like I'm somewhat of a nice guy. At least for the purposes of this interview, we'll say I'm somewhat of a nice guy, right? So to play somebody that was so obviously a jerk and then would sort of tease the audience with little bits of decency sort of woven into his jerkiness was sort of, it was fun for me. But at the end of the day, I kind of look back and when people stop me and say, oh, you're that jerk on Friends. I'm like, yes, yes, I am. And yes, I was, but I'm not a jerk in real life. Just that was a character who was a very bad man. So it's, it's sort of fun. I think people know a lot. of. I, I hope that people know when you're playing a character, it's just that character. But sometimes people don't have that ability to separate you from the character. I'm not just talking about me. I'm talking about actors in general that become synonymous or well-known as a certain character. They're kind of viewed as that guy or that girl or that, you know, they're viewed as that person. So um, I hope that people know the jerk you see on TV is not the jerk I am in person. That did not come out right, but you know what I mean. And I suppose, Mitchell, in terms of playing a, a guest character, was it fun to play the ultimate sort of womanizer in terms of that sort of sort of role? And you say not in terms of real life now, but in terms of playing that sort of fantasy sort of reality in terms of that Barry just couldn't help himself, dare I say. You know, I, I don't know. It was sort of it was a little depressing to me. And I, I think it's sort of fun to play a character that's a little on the edge, that's a little past what you would be or what you are in real life. So that that part of it's always interesting and fun. But I couldn't help as as a human being just going, oh, geez, this guy. Oh, no, I, don't don't make him do that. Is that what I'm going to do this week? Because I, I think I came back for, I don't know, like six or seven episodes over the run of the show. And I was always hoping when I came back that it would be, oh, ooh, that's a little. And, and a lot of people, the funny part is, People ask me about my time, my experience, what was it like? And especially a lot of young guys, when they say, oh, dude, you were Barry on Friends. What was it like kissing Rachel? That's always the first thing I get. It's like, what was it like kissing Rachel? You got to kiss Jennifer Aniston. And I had to think about it. I said, well, imagine kissing someone you've only known as a friend for years um, in front of an audience of a few hundred people in about 120 degrees. Uh, sweating like a pig. It's not as romantic as they make it out to be. So even getting to play that sort of smarmy womanizer character, not as romantic as it would seem. Just, you know, it, it felt a little creepy. But at the end of the day, when I watched it back, I was like, yeah, the creepiness actually worked. They directed me properly. They wrote it really well. So the creepiness actually really paid off. And I suppose, Mitchell, in terms of being a guest star and coming in, obviously there's long hours for Chandler and Joey and... Uh, Ross and these sort of characters in between takes did they interact with guest uh, cast members in terms of uh, camaraderie there or were they just mainly right we go back to our lockers call us when the next sort of shoot or well it was it a very sort of welcoming feel to people that were coming on uh, appearing maybe for an episode and maybe going again and coming back again and so on you know what that's an excellent question first of all and my situation was a little bit different than a typical guest star. First of all, I think because I was a recurring character and because I came back multiple times, it wasn't just a one shot. So I had the chance to build those relationships along the way. Another thing was at the same time that I was doing Friends, I had my own series on NBC called Minor Adjustments. So I think for that yeah. first season or two that I was on Friends, I was also shooting my own NBC show that I was a regular on. So there was a little bit of a different dynamic there. I think they knew that I was also doing a different show and I'd done a few movies and I'd known some of the actors from Friends from before. So I think there was a different, there was a, it was a little bit different than going on as just maybe just as a one shot guest star. But to answer your, your question more specifically, I, I felt very welcome. And I think all those things kind of contributed to that. But the fact that the, ga the cast welcomed me in, and, and, and again, when you're going on as a guest star, even if you're not a recurring character, even if you've done no, no other work on any other movie, TV show, you're just going in, it's your first gig. There is this bit of, you know, feeling a little intimidated going in or feeling like, mm, here I am with an established show. 
people are, you know, they already have their relationships. I'm coming in for one week. How am I going to get treated? And for the most part, on almost every show I've been on where I was a guest star, that was never an issue. The, the, fr the characters on Friends were very welcoming. I think also because my first episode, episode on the show was actually episode number, what, number two of the show? So I was there pretty much at the beginning. So it wasn't as if I had come into the show where it was already a known quantity, it was already a hit show, and here I am and here they are. So I feel like we sort of came up together at the same time. I was there from the beginning. And again, that led to a certain ease around everyone going, you know, in a reciprocal way as well. So I think I had sort of the perfect storm. Also, I was actually up for the role of uh, both Chandler and Ross. So okay. I came down to the very last, you know, for, for the role of Ross, I think at the very end, it was me and David Schwimmer. And they ended up going with David Schwimmer, which was a perfect casting call. And that's how I ended up getting the role of Barry, because they remembered me from auditioning for Ross. They're like, hey, would you like to do this part? I was like, yeah, of course, it's a great show. Why would I not want to be a part of it? So I had a little bit of a history with the show to begin with. So all those things sort of came together for a really easy, fun experience with the other actors. Mitchell, you just answered my question there. I was going to ask you where you sort of sussed out for, for the role of Barry, but you've already uh, mentioned that. I suppose, what was a working week uh, like on the set of Friends? From a Monday morning when you came in, was there sort of table reads? Was there, I imagine most of the shooting was done on set. You had locations in the sort of studio. There was very little outside sort of a block shooting. And I don't know if you have, or did you have any sort of outside block shooting from your time in Friends? No, most of my stuff was either done on the main set or the swing set. And for your listeners that don't know, you know, and you, you obviously know how, the, how the, everything works with, you know, shooting outside, doing remote shooting and stuff. But so when you have a sitcom, there are certain fixtures on the set that don't change. A uh, central perk, the apartments, the bedrooms, there are certain sets that they have there that are pretty much used every week. And then there's usually a fourth, the third or a fourth or a fifth set on the stage that they call the swing set. And the swing set is something that, that can be something different every week. Like one week in an episode for me, it might be my orthodontist office. On another week, it might be someplace else that the cast goes to visit. Um, so there's always that swing set. So either I was on the main set or the swing set, but either one, all of my stuff took, took place on the stage. Although I wish, being a native New Yorker, I wish I could have gone out to do some of the remote stuff that they shot around Central Park, that they shot around the city, uh, especially all the stuff that you see in the opening credit, but uh, in the opening credits. But man, that would have been a lot of fun to get sent back to New York to shoot. There are only a couple of times I've had to actually do that in my career where I've gone back to New York to do work, having come from New York. And that's always kind of exciting going back, you know, being paid to go back to your hometown for a visit, but you're actually working. It's very cool. But no, sad to say most of my stuff was on the stage, but it, it worked. It worked out pretty well anyway. And Mitchell, what was it like coming back, say, well into a few seasons in Friends now? Obviously, the show has hit national stardom. It's probably one of the big popularity. Was there a different sort of vibe or feel to it coming back maybe from, say, I say, episode two, uh, where you are in the first season, then coming back later on, obviously, when it's taken off and it's seen all, and obviously it's all these actors and actresses have, have been cast into sort of national stardom. Because let's face it, Friends made stars out of Courtney Cox and Rachel. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Courtney Cox and Jennifer Aniston and Matt LeBlanc. Uh, they were, little was sort of known about them beforehand in terms of one or two of them. In terms of national exposure, yeah, that's true. Um, I, I have to say that another another really good question. Um, I'm not surprised that Santa Cats came up like, man, that was a good question. Why am I surprised? Um, no, it, I, I feel like, well, first of all, when I think let's let's take it back to when I first got there because when I first got there and the thing that attracted me, when I actually read the script for the first time when I was actually auditioning for the parts of uh, Chandler and Ross, I read the script and it was only, there were only two scripts in my career that I read and I said, not only do I want to be a part of this, this is going to be a huge hit. And that was the pilot for Friends and the screenplay for Field of Dreams. And those are the two projects that I looked and went, oh my God, I have to be, you know. Uh, so I think going into Friends, I read the script, I knew it was going to be a big show. That being said, when you're starting the first season, as you put out there, you don't really, you never know as an actor what's going to happen. Even if it's the perfect storm of things, great actors, great script, great directors, great studio, great network. Sometimes things just don't click and it doesn't happen. You don't know why. But this is sort of a perfect storm where everything was there from the performers to the writing, to the directing, producing, studio, network, everything. And 
I think there was an excitement from the beginning of the show. Now, again, it's sort of like a tempered enthusiasm because you don't really know what's going to happen. But I think all the actors had this feeling of excitement that they were part of, part of something special, which is why I was happy to come back as Barry and didn't look at it as like, oh, well, you didn't make it as one of the series regulars. We're going to give you. I didn't look at it as a second fiddle thing. I looked at it as great. I get to be a part of something wonderful. And I think as the years went on, as the show sort of hit what we thought and hoped it would become, there was sort of the, it never became where I went on the set and people wouldn't look at me and now everyone is so big. It never became like that. Everyone was always pretty grounded and everyone, I think everyone kept each other in check. There was this camaraderie on the set and it was so much fun on the set that it never got to the point where people felt on the outside, which was really to their credit because it would have been easy to, you know, have a guest come in and feel that way. Um, you can tell, I think after show's been on for several years, there's a different, there's a definitely a different ease about it, not an arrogance or an attitude or superior, like we're a hit show, just an ease about it because now you're not as worried And that first season. You don't know what's going to happen. Is this show going to last for five episodes or five years or you don't know, but once the show has gotten picked up and achieves a certain status, I think there's a certain ease like, okay, now I'm not saying relax to the point where you don't try, or, but there's a certain ease of, and a relaxation that goes along with, okay. We're where we want to be. Now we can have fun. We don't have to worry every week is our job on the line every week. We can just spread our wings and have fun. So I think once a show hits that point, there is more of an ease than anything else. But no, I didn't feel like uh, anyone got too big for their britches, for lack of a better term, or there was none of that. It was always that same comfort. In fact, I think as time went on, it became more comfortable because people felt that comfort because the show has sort of had settled into what it became. And I suppose, Mitchell, in terms of your own character, Barry, obviously it was guest appearing. So obviously when you, obviously having friends on your credits uh, opened up any opportunities for you as an actor, having it on your resume. And obviously people, you weren't sort of tied to that sort of Barry character for a long, vast period of time that the public perception recognised you in terms of that, in terms of any role. But I'm just wondering in terms of like... Friends was a massive success, but if you look at some characters like Matt LeBlanc, he's ever tied to that Joey character. Everyone sees him, it's Joey, it's Joey. So it's very hard to portray a different character or a different actor or appear in something else when people, the audience, just associate you. It's like um, the Sheldon Cooper character in Big Bang Theory. It's right, just right. you're always associated or tagged to that wherever you go. Did you find maybe that while Friends opened the doors for you in terms of other opportunities that maybe in terms of some actors that were ever forever tied to a certain role? Uh, I don't know, because like I said, I, I, I was very fortunate where I actually started doing films before I started doing television in terms of like, you know, being in the public eye. So I'd already had a few films under my belt before I even came to Friends. So for me, I feel like I had a, a decent foundation before Friends. So I wasn't relying on just Friends for people to see me and go, oh, he's on that. Maybe we could put him in this, which is the best case scenario for anybody that's in Hollywood. You hope that work breeds more work, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd already done other things before this, so I didn't feel like I was relying on it or it was solely because of Friends that B or C or D happened. But listen, I'm sure it didn't hurt. I mean, being on a show like that where people see you, even if it's only six or seven times over the course of a run of a show, there's a certain notoriety that goes along with that. Or if you're mentioning someone and they didn't see a movie that you're in, oh, remember he was Barry on Friends? Oh, yeah. You know, of course that can backfire if Barry on Friends isn't the character that I'm auditioning for and they're associating me with that, but the character that I want to, you know, that I want to be doing now is different and they think of you as that. Sometimes you have to go in an audition and undo that perception, you know? But I can understand there is the, you know, the, the yin and the yang of it where there's a great upside where you've, You've achieved this great success. You've made a lot of money. You've done this character. I mean, the series regulars, not me. And then the downside is there is a chance that some people might think of you as that character always. Now, I think there are a lot of smart people in Hollywood. There are some not so smart people in Hollywood. It's like everything else. There's a mix of all different kinds of people. They're going to be the really smart people in the studios, directors, producers, writers that know that just because you had success as that character doesn't mean you are that, that you could do other things. And, um, you know, I think there are always going to be a few people that are like, oh, I always see that character. I always see them when I see them. And that's going to happen every once in a while. But I think for the most part, I'd like to think that at least people in the industry will recognize your talent for, you know, creating that character and know that that can be used to create something else. And the audience also has to get past that. 
the audience that might recognize you as that character, it may take them a couple of episodes before they unsee that and see you as this new character that you're portraying. So sometimes it's with the audience, not just the people that are casting and creating the show, but the people that are watching the show that have to get used to seeing you as someone else in something different and sort of train their own ear and their own eye like, oh, you know what? After a couple of episodes, I didn't even see him as Joey. I didn't even see him as Ross or Rachel or Phoebe. I just saw this new character. Um, so I think, yeah, it can take some time, but in the end, I th I'd like to think a person's talent will win out and, uh, the characters they're able to portray, they'll, they'll be cast as those characters and the audience will accept them. It just may take a little time. Mitchell, we're nearly coming to the end of the interview now. I have three final questions to ask you. I'm just going to break away from Friends for a moment and just ask you, you probably as an actor, you've traveled the world. Have you ever graced our shores here in Ireland? And if so, what are your memories of this country? Uh, you know what? Uh, my my cousin married a wonderful guy from outside of Dublin, and I, I wish I had gone. I, I could still go. We still talk. We're still friends. Uh, they're they're not together, but I got to keep him in the divorce. So he keeps on telling me how gorgeous it is. He's like, gorgeous. It's gorgeous. I was like, I have to come see it. I have to come. See. And all I hear is the most beautiful stories. Anyone that's been there tells me that when you get there, you never want to leave. The people are as beautiful as the landscape. So I have to come visit at some point. And of course, don't worry, I'm not going to come knocking on your door and say, hey, I'm here now. What are you going to do with me? But I have not been, but I am definitely going to come see Ireland. It is just, from what I hear, the most beautiful place on the planet. And Mitchell, uh, for the penultimate question, I'm going to take you back to Friends now again. And let's pretend there wasn't a Friends encyclopedia, a dictionary as such, of all the characters and guest stars throughout the season that appeared in Friends. And let's say they put your character, Barry Faber, uh, in that as our encyclopedia. And they left two blank sentences underneath the synopsis to describe what a person he was. And they rang up your talent agent and got on to you, Mitchell, and said, we want Mitchell to write those two sentences to summar summarize him. Not an epithet or such, but just to summarize what a character, if you're walking down the street and he passed you by, what you would say to your significant other to describe him. You want to know what it is? You know, this. You, by the way, your questions are fantastic. These are like some of the best questions that I've ever been asked on any interview. So... Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go with, I'm going to keep it very simple for you. Poor Barry, he just couldn't help himself. I think that sums him up. He's That's kind so of this guy. I, I don't think that he didn't have a lot of guile. He was like, he was so obvious and couldn't get out of his own way. I don't think there was a lot. There was a ton of like obvious manipulation and malice. He's just sort of a simple idiot. He just, poor Barry, he just poor couldn't him. help himself. On that note of uh, poor Barry, for the final 30 seconds, Mitch, Mitchell, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mitchell, Whit Mitchell Whitfield. Uh, have you any sort of stories or memories that are unique to you from your time on Friends? Maybe in between takes, a funny story, a funny interaction with any of the main characters that people aren't aware of that still makes you laugh today, maybe a smile or a blooper, something oh. that just uh, that makes you sort of giggle or even it's so fresh in your memory that you'll never forget it as such it's, it's personal for you and when you think of friends or you think of that actor you just always remember that sort of certain story you know uh i the camaraderie of the whole experience i remember it very well even like you said in between takes just looking at each other making each other laugh just a silly look or a silly ad lib that one of the actors would make but specifically there was one moment and i i i don't know if you remember it was a pretty I think well-known moment where, uh, you know, our characters, Jennifer and my characters sort of get together for, and that's the, you know, the G version mm -hmm. getting together uh, in my dentist chair. And there's a shot of us sort of cuddling afterwards with the little dentist paper blanket over us. And we're just cuddling, you know, post bliss in this dentist chair. And I remember sitting there with Jennifer we're looking at each other and we're laughing because it was the most, like I said earlier, you know, people ask, oh, what was it like to kiss, have a romantic scene? It was the most unromantic moment ever. And it was ridiculously uncomfortable. And we were sweating and hot and we were trying to cover ourselves, you know, just, you know, to make sure it looked like we were, you know, not naked, but sort of naked, but covered with this paper blanket, which doesn't really cover you. And people are trying to do your makeup and wipe the sweat off of you. And it's supposed to be all cuddly and romantic. And it wasn't. And we both were laughing because it's like, it's hard to be romantic in those moments anyway. But it, this was even less romantic than anyone could ever imagine. So I always imagine being in that dentist chair with Jennifer laughing at how ridiculous it was. 
And then when I watch, whenever I watch the show, I don't get to see it that often, but when, but when I do and I see that scene, I just start to laugh because I know what it looks like on camera and I know what it felt like shooting the scene. So sort of the, dichot the dichotomy of those two things, how it looked versus what it was like, classic. So I always think of that dentist chair and I don't recommend if you want to take someone on a lovely, lovely romantic weekend, I would just caution everyone to involving a dentist chair. Well, uh, Mitchell, I suppose many of the guy has often dreamt about uh, Jennifer Aniston on a, on a dentist chair. Would obviously <laughs> I ruin it? Gl gl gladly have that sort of experience. So, uh, but uh, on that note, uh, Mitchell Whitfield, uh, thanks for sharing your time with us today, sharing your memories of playing Barry Faber in our special feature, The Many Faces of Friends. Obviously, you appeared in six episodes, a recurring sort of role, there from the start, an intricate sort of character interwoven between the lives of uh, Rachel Green, played by the one and only Jennifer Aniston. Thanks for sharing your memories and... Uh, no doubt, hopefully, if there's ever a reboot in time, they might go back. They might go back in time in terms of uh, uh, a nostalgia episode, and you might face my feature again. But for the moment, Richard Whitfield, take care and God bless. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>